Good day. It's my pleasure today to talk to you about the mechanisms of actions of nucleoside RT inhibitors and a new class of drugs, nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitors. Here are my disclosures. When coming up with a title for this talk, I thought an appropriate title would be Back to Basics, since I've been charged with talking mainly about mechanism and thinking about how drugs work. So today I'm going to review the basic science of reverse transcription, talk about the mechanism of action of nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and introduce to you the first nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, Islatravir, and talk a bit about resistance to both classes. So just a bit about the basics of reverse transcription, we could probably spend an hour talking about it. Double-stranded DNA is synthesized from single-stranded RNA used as a template. And this is basically the process by which reverse transcription occurs. Reverse transcriptase, the enzyme that facilitates reverse transcription, has two basic functions. First, the DNA polymerase activity or the copy function, which we know is error prone, and the RNase H activity, which serves to degrade the RNA template in the RNA DNA complex. And this activity is facilitated by reverse transcriptase function, which has a thumb, palm, finger structure. Critically, initiation of reverse transcription requires a primer. And within the cell, there's host transfer RNA with a three prime hydroxy group that binds to the primer binding site and initiates reverse transcription. Very importantly, DNA synthesis occurs in the newly infected cell. And it's been a long time since all of us took biochemistry. So I just wanted to put in some nice pictures that shows how the process normally occurs. So the primer provides a template for incorporation of the DNTP at the P site. And the process incorporates a monophosphorylated deoxyribonucleotide at the end site. And this is a, a critical because there's formation of the deoxyribose backbone of a double helix and eventual base pairing in the double-stranded DNA. And on the right, you can see as how the triphosphorylated nucleotide provides the energy for this reaction. And then to the right, you can see how the monophosphorylated nucleotide is incorporated into the backbone of the uh, for forming DNA chain. Now, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors are analogs of naturally occurring nucleotides. And perhaps the first and best known of this uh, class of drugs initially was idovidine or AZT, which is shown on the right of this slide. And you can see quite clearly that the difference between the natural uh, substrate thymidine and the drug AZT is the presence of this three prime hydroxy group. So how does AZT work or the whole class of nucleoside RT inhibitors? Well, Nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors lack that critical three prime hydro hydroxy group. And these drugs complete, uh, compete with uh, DNTPs in the cell for incorporation into the nascent minus strand DNA and the subsequent plus strand DNA and cause chain termination. So you can see here's the drug, triphosphorylated, that triphosphorylated moiety provides the energy for incorporation of the um, monophosphorylated drug now into the nascent chain. And because there's no hydroxy group here, there's chain termination. And that's the basic way in which these drugs work. Now, currently, these are the clinically relevant NRTIs, the adenosine analogs, tenofovir, the TDF, and tenofovir alafenamide, the cytosine analogs, lamivudine and entracitabine, the guanosine analog, abacavir, and the thymidine analog, zidovidine. 
And I say that these are the clinically relevant NRTIs because if you go into current treatment guidelines, including US, WHO, et cetera, these drugs are included as uh, potential treatments, et cetera. They may not be first line, they may be alternates, et cetera. But these are the drugs that are still mentioned in treatment guidelines. I think it's very important to remember, and I try to uh, uh, hint at this, that uh, NRTIs are pro-drugs, which means that they need to be uh, either dye or tri phosphorylated by cellular kinases in order to become active drugs. And this occurs intracellularly. And it is the levels of intracellular di or triphosphated um, uh, NRTIs that really determine the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of this class of drug. And it's very important to remember that relative levels of natural substrates or DMTPs and the phosphorylated NRTIs, the inhibitors, may vary depending on levels of cellular activation and relative levels of cellular kinases and transporters. And this all comes together to make this class of drug a very cell dependent. And this actually has played out very interestingly in uh, the story about uh, a TDF as prevention in a difference between rectal transmission and uh, vaginal transmission. In talking about um, the uh, nucleoside RT inhibitors, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a bit about TDF and TAF. As you know, TDF or tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate is the formulation of tenofovir that has been with us for many, many years. And uh, tenofovir alafenamide or TAF is uh, the newer formulation of the same drug. And uh, TAF basically was uh, formulated to try to get around some of the toxicity issues of tenofovir. And um, on this slide, you can see at the bottom that TDF is very well absorbed and rapidly converted into free tenofovir in the plasma. And then that tenofovir goes into cells where you want it to go, but it also goes into cells where you don't want it to go. And it is thought that that high level, that high plasma level is associated with some of the um, uh, adverse events associated with TDF, like bone disease and renal disease. On the other hand, TAF, which is given at a much lower dose, results in much lower systemic levels of tenofovir, as you can see by those little uh, blue dots, but is preferentially taken up by uh, PBMCs and lymphocytes, et cetera, and within those cells metabolized to cathepsin A, to, to the active tenofovir after diphosphate, after phosphorylation. And it's believed, and I think it's been proven at this point, that is why TAF certainly seems to have a much better adverse event profile than TDF. Now, we have been living in a less than perfect world for a long time, and there's no doubt that over the 30 years or so that we've been working with HIV drugs or that there have been enormous, enormous uh, advances, but there are still clinical limitations, lipodystrophy due to my mitochondrial toxicity, which is caused by a combination of cellular mechanisms, including inhibition of mitochondrial gamma polymerase. I talked a little bit about TDF bone and renal toxicities. We do see some increases in LDL, HDL, and triglycerides associated with TAF, and abacavir does have a hypersensitivity uh, uh, issue as well as car cardiovascular toxicity. And of course, we can never forget uh, uh, resistance to NRTIs. And internationally, it's estimated that probably 10% of patients have pre existing resistance to NRTIs because of the transmission of NRTI resistant viruses. And of course, treatment emergent resistance to NRTIs. And this whole topic of the clinical limitations of the current NRTIs has been nicely reviewed in a recent paper by Ryan et al. 
in expert opinion in emerging drugs in 2018, which is referenced on this slide. Just a little bit about um, resistance to NRTIs. Um, there are two mechanisms by which uh, resistance can occur. Uh, mechanism number one is excision, and there are mutations that occur within RT that alter structure so that the incorporated chain terminating NRTI monophosphate can be excised effectively. And this is the mechanism for the so-called thymidine analog mutations that include 41, 67, 70, et cetera. And these affect all the NRTIs with the exception of amibudine and tricytabine. And then the other mechanism is a discrimination issue where there's decreased incorporation uh, due to amino acid changes around the active site. And these are the point mutations that are well known uh, to most of you, 65, 74, 151, and 184. And these affect lamivudine and tricytabine, tenofovir, and abacavir. And again, an obstacle to the use of these drugs. So with that background, I'm going to introduce you to a drug called Islatravir, otherwise known as NK8591, or formerly EFDA. And um, I've worked with this drug and uh, um, have written a couple of review articles. And so I refer you to um, a good review article that really does talk about uh, basic science that I wrote with Stefan Serafianos, who really did a lot of the basic science work with this drug. Uh, and that appeared in current opinions in uh, uh, HIV and AIDS in 2018. But what I want to highlight are three structural features of this drug. First, a four-ethinyl group, second, a fluoride group at the second ring here, and a three-prime hydroxy group. And remember, as I told you earlier, all the uh, nucleoside RT inhibitors lack a three-prime hydroxy group. That's how they act as chain terminators. So the mechanism of action of Islatravir is quite different from NRTIs. And the, the four prime ethinyl group actually binds tightly into a, a very well conserved portion of reverse transcriptase near the primer site. And this binding causes immediate chain termination. In addition, the presence of this hydroxy group actually increases the affinity of the drug for reverse transcriptase because it looks more like natural substrate number one. And number two, the presence of this hydroxy group also allows for delayed chain termination. So we have two mechanisms, the initial lock in place, which prevents translocation, and then the second prolonged activity where that prevention of translocation and the presence of the hydroxy group allows for delayed chain termination. Now there's also a fluoride group here that's very important for this particular drug. And that's shown on this particular slide. So the presence of that fluoride group makes Islatravir relatively resistant to deamination uh, uh, by uh, adenosine deaminase. And here's a uh, paper that appeared in 2008, looking at the percent of, a, of the drug that is deaminated so if you look at Islatravir, which has the fluorine, as opposed to EDA that doesn't, you can see quite clearly that over 90 minutes, the EDA is rapidly deaminated, whereas Islatravir is relatively resistant to deamination. The other important consideration is that Islatravir is super potent and active against a variety of NRTI resistant variants. So first I wanna call your attention to the top row, which looks at the activity of EFDA against wall type virus. And you can see that in this experiment, EFDA in vitro is tenfold more active than AZT, which is amongst our classic NRTIs, the most active drug. You can see the relative uh, um, activities of 3TC and DDI. And tenofovir is, again, uh, not as active in vitro as, as AZT. 
Now I'll call your attention to these point mutations and other multiple mutations that cause high level resistance to, um, uh, to NRTIs, uh, particularly drugs like AZT, D4T, et cetera. And you can see that EFDA really retains activity against a wide variety of these so-called thymidine analog mutations, as well as some of the point mutations that we talked about earlier. Now, resistance to EFDA is conferred by the M184V mutation. And in this experiment, the presence of M184V did cause about a 7.5 increase in 7.5 reduction in susceptibility. However, this level of drug is, is quite easily achieved in vivo. And uh, in, in a study conducted by uh, Merck, uh, two monkeys that had, uh, uh, in, were infected with M184V viruses and had clear significant clinical progression were uh, salvaged with uh, islatrovir treatment alone. So it's very likely that um, islatrovir not only has um, potent activity against wild type viruses, but also has excellent activity against a large selection of NRTI resistant variants. And I think that drug is going to be very promising clinically. Another issue about islatrovir is that it's unlikely to be associated with my, mitochondrial toxicity. So this is a, a basically a, uh, an experiment that. Uh, was published by Sol et al. in 2012, just showing that EFDA triphosphate has a very, very low affinity for uh, the gamma polymerase that's associated with mitochondrial uh, toxicity as compared to, let's say, natural substrate, which uh, is readily incorporated into um, uh, mitochondrial DNA. So um, it's believed that the likelihood that uh, EFDA or islatrovir will cause uh, mitochondrial toxicity. So what does this all add up to clinically? And I think uh, quite excitingly, uh, Islatrovir or MK8591 has not only potent antiviral activity, but it has activity that lasts a long time because it locks in, it prevents, uh, it's an immediate and delayed chain terminator, and it's relatively resistant to deamination and excision. So as you can see here, single doses as low as 0.5 milligrams to 30 milligrams in this paper that was presented by Matthews et al. at the International AIDS Conference shows robust antiviral activity. A single dose, and you can see at day seven, at the higher doses, you still have uh, antiviral activity, and this is extends out to day 10. And just a note here that the uh, half-life of Islatrovir triphosphate in humans is uh, about 120 hours. It's quite long. Similarly, in rhesus macaques, where the half-life is about 50 hours, two doses of a drug anywhere from 3.9 to 18.2 mg per kid demonstrated robust antiviral activity. So we have a drug that is extremely long acting and has robust antiviral activity against wild type virus. So let me show you a couple of experiments that um, my team worked on in collaboration with Merck. We first looked at the potential for Islatrovir as PrEP in the rhesus macaque SHIV model. So basically what we did was put drug on board, shown here in this blue arrow, and continue to give drug once a week orally at 3.9 mg per kid. One week after getting the drug on board, we challenged the animals repeatedly with a low dose intrarectal challenge of 50 TCID50 of our SHIV virus and follow the animals out for 24 weeks. And quite extraordinarily shown here, the treated animals were all protected whereas control animals who were only getting basically vehicle got uh, infected with uh, most of them, uh, six out of the eight uh, within one challenge, another after two, and then one more after four. And this translated into a hazard ratio 
of 41.5. So treated animals had a 41.5 less chance of being infected. And you can see this is a very highly statistically significant value. We repeated this experiment reducing doses of NK8591 or Izlatravir and got as low as 0.1 mg per kid and showed complete protection. We also more recently looked at the potential of uh, Izlatravir as PEP. So it, obviously this is an IV challenge model, not with a SHIV, but with SIV MAC251. So this is like giving an animal a blood transfusion of SIV infected blood. So you challenge the animal within 24 hours after, you give a first dose, and then we did once a week for four weeks, then we waited seven weeks, did once a week for three weeks, we waited seven more weeks, did once a week for two weeks, and then finally one dose. And what we found basically that we had complete protection all the way down to stage four. And at stage four with the one weekly dose, we did get two animals become infected. The great thing about that uh, experiment is that if you translate the levels of drug that were completely protective, it's believed that we could probably give a single dose orally to an exposed uh, human because of the differences in half-life and probably achieve protection for the month. Very exciting data. Uh, not sure exactly how to do that clinical trial. Again, uh, very, very exciting. One of the other things I haven't mentioned is that Izlatravir is also quite easily formulated, not only orally, but also as a absorbable polymer. And um, there's research looking at its ability to be implanted and provide protection as PrEP over a period of a, as long as 12 months. So NRTIs do remain the cornerstone of the treatment of HIV infection. Importantly, they're prodrugs that require intracellular activation. There are issues surrounding long-term toxicities that though ameliorated, do remain. And thereby there, there's a niche for novel agents. I hope that um, I introduced you to a, a new exciting agent. That's the first nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. The drug is potent, it has a long duration of action, it has activity against NRTI resistant variants, something I didn't have time to show you, but it does have versatility in formulation, and it does have, as I presented, potential for both treatment and prevention. It's active as PrEP in preclinical studies that are consistent with yearly implants in humans, and it's also active as PEP at levels that can be achieved for four weeks with a single oral dose. So I'm going to stop there. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and I'm very anxious to uh, answer any questions you might have. Thank you for your attention.